Entrepreneurial Edge is brought to you by Business Banking from FNB. Because small ideas can lead to big business. FNB, how can we help you? Hello and a warm welcome to the Entrepreneurial Edge. I'm Chris Bishop. Now surely in these difficult times when the whole world is tightening its belt, it's a hard sell. How do you convince corporates in Africa with their dwindling budgets to part with big money for luxuries? Those little items that everyone looks at in the shop window and most people walk away from, including me. Now money is tight out there. This week, we look at the career of an entrepreneur who has made a business out of getting people to buy those luxury brands, from watches to pens. We welcome into the studio Mark Hoffman of the Lux Group, CEO he is. Before we chat to him, let's take a quick look at what the Lux Group is all about. About two years ago, uh, we identified some brands in the country that we felt um, could be doing a lot better and we had an opportunity to invest in those brands and um, drive the business and grow those brands in this market. We import, distribute and market luxury lifestyle brands. Um, we look for brands that we feel have potential, international brands that have growth potential in South Africa and Africa. And we um, bring those brands into the country and develop them in the local market. Uh, brands like U-Boat, um, which is a watch brand, Montegrappa, high-end pen brand, uh, and Skull Candy, which is a lifestyle audio brand. Our target market depends on the brands that we carry. Um, a brand like U-Boat would appeal to someone between the ages of 25 up to around 50 years old. You know, it's a very um, good looking, well-made product um, that appeals to a specific customer. Montegrappa is a high-end pen brand. You know, it appeals to someone who's got a lot of taste, who's a pen collector, who's into the craft around products. Um, Skull Candy is a lifestyle audio brand, it appeals to youth all the way through to um, older audiophiles that are looking for products that can add value to their daily lives. We're working with some other countries outside of South Africa, places like Mozambique and Angola and um, you know these are good, credible, strong brands that will work in those markets and we're looking to grow into those areas. When we took on the business, we grew it in the first year you know, we doubled the business within the first year and we think, you know, in this current year we'll probably increase by about 70-80%. Now in the studio with me I have Mark Hoffman, the CEO of the Lux Group. Welcome to the studio, Mark. Thank you, Chris. And um, you from an entrepreneurial family, your, your father and your grandfather were both entrepreneurs in the hotel and catering business. Do you think that rubbed off on you at all? Chris, I think definitely it rubbed off on me. I think... Um, from, whenever, from as young as I can remember, you know, my father s spoke to me about the importance of education, that uh, if you have an education and a professional qualification, no one can ever take that away from you. But he also stressed to me the, uh, you know, the, the benefits and the, um, yeah, the desires or the, or, the, or the upside of being involved in business for yourself and the ability to be able to control your your business destiny. Uh, I think it was something that was really ingrained to us. I remember sitting around the table as a, as a family. We always discussed business. It was part of uh, how we were as a family growing up. You know, business was part of our environment. And your grandfather was it? He held he owned shares in the fam the famous sorry Palana Hotel in Mozambique. Correct. Mozambique. Correct. Tell us a bit about that. Correct. Um, my father and my grandfather were partners in the Palana Hotel. Uh, which they held for many years until it was nationalised in the late 90, in the early 1970s when there was a revolution in Mozambique, and I think that experience also rubbed off on on uh, how my father brought us up because from owning a, a jewel in Africa to the next day having it completely taken away, I think that uh, made quite an impact on him in terms of in terms of business. But the family owned it for for many years. As I said, it was nationalised in the 70s, and then when Mo Mozambique became a democracy again in 19, in 1988, the late 80s, uh, he went back to went back to Mozambique and was able to 
renegotiate a deal with the new Mozambican government and re-establish a connection back with the Palana. So he was working with the Palana Yoga after this period. And, and what, what sort of condition was it like then when he went back? Uh, not a good condition at all, Chris. I mean, they were bullet-ridden. It had been uh, you know, shot up during the war, during the Civil War in Mozambique. And uh, there was no maintenance at all on the hotel. In fact, uh, it tells a funny story about what they used to do in, in terms of upgrading the hotel is they progressively closed the f each floor in the hotel. So when the carpets were worn out on one floor, they just pull them out of the top floor, shut that or mothball that top floor, and then refurbish the floor below it. So when they went back in there, it was not in any kind of grandeur as, as a hotel that is remembered as. Amazing lessons from your entrepreneurial grandfather. And I come down the generations. You, you qualified as a chartered accountant. Uh, and then you decided you wanted to work for yourself. What was your first venture? My first venture was into the uh, sports business. Um, a friend of mine who was at Varsity with me at the same time had just started, embarked on setting up a sports business. I was very passionate about sport. In fact, I'd played sport for South Africa and uh, I wanted to pursue a career in sport, in sports management. And it was exciting. I was excited about the concept of a startup business, something building something from the ground level up. And uh, we got involved in business together, developing a, uh, or expanding a gross motor skill program for, uh, for young kids, kids between the ages of two to seven. Uh, there was a commercial side to that business that we also then rolled out into a social responsibility program um, with corporate sponsors and uh, national coverage. And you played sport for South Africa. What did, what did you play? I played uh, touch rugby. Okay. Yeah. And um, you were looking after the interests of some of the big names in cricket and soccer, um, Graham Smith, the South African captain, for instance? Correct. As part of, uh, as an aside to the business, there was a sports uh, player management division in the, within the business. So we were involved with athletes like Graham Smith, who we took from literally schoolboy to South African captain, which was a pretty amazing journey to, to be involved in that and work through that. Uh, we were involved with national captains in the football industry, uh, in, in South African football, and captains of Kaiser Chiefs and uh, Orlando Pirates. So uh, it was an exciting time. People always say it's a cutthroat business, that one there. Is that right? Player management. Yeah. Uh, it's a very challenging business. I think South Africa is quite a, quite a small market in terms of yeah, player management. I think everyone sees Jerry Maguire and has exactly. this... Exactly. Uh, I was going to say Jerry Maguire. ...has this picture of show me the money. Um, is, is that true, though? I mean... I think there's an element to that. I think if you've got the right kind of athletes with the right mentality, there's an element to that. Um, where you can, you can be innovative and do exciting things with athletes and you have those highs. I mean, certainly when Graham was made national captain, that was an amazing time for us in the business. But I think generally, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of grind that goes behind sports management. There's 80% of the athletes that you, that you work with generally don't have a professional approach to, to uh, in terms of managing their affairs. I mean, crazy, crazy stories of the kind of things that they do. Like, tell us one. Uh, I'm bound by confidentiality, Chris. I can't expose <laughs> any, any of those athletes to that. To well, to well maybe it's another show, yeah. So, um, uh, and then what gave you the idea of, uh, of Lux getting involved there? Because it's a bit of a turn from sports to luxury goods. Uh, yeah, I think it is a turn, but I think if you're an entrepreneur at heart, it's not really about the industry that you're involved in. I think it's more about you seeing opportunities and gaps in the market. And... Um, and also your passion that drives you. It's, I think that's, that's, that's critical to being successful or, or driven as an entrepreneur. You need to have a passion about what you're gonna be involved in and what you're working on. And my passion has always been around adding value to people's lives. And uh, we saw, you know, Lux, we saw, we saw an opportunity there with brands and products that inspire people and that create energy for people, bring joy to people, bring passion to people. And we saw uh, an opportunity to develop those brands in the South African market. We felt they were underdeveloped and there was a gap in the market for, for some of those brands. So how did you start out with Lux? What were the nuts and bolts of, of taking up their business? Um, how it started out was interesting. My brother had recently set up a uh, import and distribution business in the lifestyle space. And we were looking to do something together. and. Uh, an opportunity arose where an existing entrepreneur was actually immigrating to the States to join some of his family there, and the opportunity arose to buy his business. Uh, so we were able to buy his business together with another business, merge the two together, and create uh, what is Lux Group today. That's about two and a half years ago that we did that. And how humble were the beginnings? Pretty humble. I think they're still pretty humble. We have a long way to go in terms of where we're going in the business, but 
the learning curve, when you sp spoke about the transition from sport into, into luxury, is, there's, a, there's a gap that has to be, uh, from a knowledge base, that has to be fulfilled, and that's ongoing. So uh, there's quite very humble beginnings in terms of learning the industry and how it works, what the requirements are to make a business work in that space. Which particular pitfalls did you come across in, in those early days in the business? I think, I think, the, uh, I think the challenge is really around... Um, I would say around managing uh, working capital requirements inside inside a business like a luxury goods business or a distribution business, uh, which is very different to the challenges around a sports business. The fact that you've got to hold stock, finance the stock, finance the marketing, and there's a long lead time around cash flow management around the business, which I think is v not unique to luxury goods, but certainly unique to this business versus a, a sports business. And we'll talk a lot more in the second half about uh, the business itself and, and the, how it works. But were there any particular days when you thought, well, I've had enough, I want to throw it in? No, never. No, never. Uh, no, never. I think uh, you know, one of the key aspects of being an entrepreneur is persistence. I think you have to have, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to have a level of persistence. You know there's going to be days where things are tough. There's days where you're certainly questioning what are you doing and are you adopting the right strategy and why am I doing this? But I don't think there's ever a day where you wake up and you say, you know, I don't want to be doing this. If that day comes, then it's the time to sort of move on to a different venture. I think that's, uh, that would be my thinking behind Obviously, that. you're quite resilient, but uh, what struggles did you have along the way when you were setting this business up? Uh, I think, you know, you always, the, the challenge really is uh, around growth and your expectations of growth and uh, an over expectation probably of what you can achieve in the short term versus what's actually achievable over the long term. I think as an entrepreneur, the challenge is uh, for me personally is a, le a level of patience because you want to run sometimes before you can walk. And really it's three years, you need three years in any business, I believe, before you can actually get a handle on what you want to be doing in the business and, 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 and an understanding of the business. So we're approaching three years in this space now. We feel we're getting a handle on how to run the business and what we want to be doing. And from here, we're able to, to get into a growth space. So I think that that's one of the challenges is, is, the, um, is that personal frustration that you want to go faster than you can actually go. Um, uh, I okay, Mark, hold that thought there. We're going to talk a lot more in the second half about your business and the challenges thereof.